Do you guys do have surveys done? Most now, most of the common thing is now the, is to have the boundary report rather than an actual survey. Specifically now with everything on the lot and block and plat book, we just say per plat book 41, and it's already written in there, and we want a boundary report. Um, we did do a survey on the 80 acres that I've got listed when we went under purchase agreement. They actually paid a surveyor to come out and do that uh, and shoot the azimuth and all that and elevations. Um, and then the offer never went through, so. Yeah. And then what if you pay for an inspection and your offer goes in the same time as someone else's and then you don't get it? So I don't know. Well, I just don't think that even works. If everybody did it the right way, then that wouldn't happen. Certainly, if a house goes up for sale and you say it's a good deal and you write an offer that day, I tell my client, let's do this the right way and schedule a home inspection, have the home inspection do it and we get an offer and all of a sudden we've missed the purchase agreement or the window so to speak but the reality is you offered a hundred grand now you got to renegotiate to 80 when our offer was going to be 80 out of the gate because we knew in advance I mean I see I can see that problem but what the what this method does and we're going backwards is eliminate any of that after negotiation issues Well, I guess my answer to that would be, uh, why would they care? They're getting paid. I mean, they're not paying that seller. And if, it's, if it means he's going to get an offer... I know I don't have to tell you. Mo probably I would call you as an agent and go, hey, we've decided that we're not going to go any further with this. And then I say why, and then you tell me, and then you that we found. To that now? No, because uh, you wouldn't necessarily mean that. And we had a guy a long time ago once that put an offer in one of our houses that said he was a home inspector, and I literally told him, do not send me the home inspection. I, I told him that. And I would tell you that. I mean, if you said, are you not putting an offer in? No. Do you want to know why? Your answer would be no. All right. But it's, it's designed so that I don't write a $100,000 offer to you and then find a bad roof and have to come back later and go, okay. It's designed to help the buyer. Yeah. Well, it's, no, it's designed to help both of you. No, and I, I've got that going now with one of my agents right now. Literally, that's going on where they had an inspection done. They called Holly and said, we want to price lowered by 10000 because they said there was a bad roof. We've asked for the report, and they're refusing to give the report. They said, okay, just cut us loose. And I already told them, no, I'm not cutting you loose. You either got to close at the price or send me proof that there's problems. You can't just say the roof's bad based on an inspection report without proving that to me. But that's a whole different issue because this is the problem that stops this exact problem. Because if, let's say, they hadn't have put the offer in, they'd have had the roof done, they'd have said, the roof is bad. We're not putting an offer in. Now we wouldn't be arguing about reducing the price. Or the second argument we're also now having is, Who's keeping the earnest money? No, because you don't have no proof of that. 
Yeah. And that's why I said, as her, I would say, I don't want to know or I don't want the inspection. No, it's, it's not written, and it's hearsay. I don't even know if that's the correct word. Zoning issues. Make sure, I mean, we do almost all do residential here, so the zoning issues shouldn't be a big problem. Um, unless we're doing like doubles or multifamily. So make sure you've got the right zoning to do that. Um, I don't, don't know for sure, but I just had someone the other day was talking about that, that their parents lived in a double and they owned the other side. And when they found out that through some kind of action with the zoning that it was actually only zoned for single family. So they were going to have to evict the other person and move the house back to. And I suggested, hey, you know, how long they've been doing that? You might want to go see if you can get a grandfather in or something. I don't know. Yeah, you could seek a variance of the zoning standard. Um, the co-brokerage relationship. You guys in the business to know that we used to use these things called sub-agents. Sub-agency has been outlaw outlawed uh, in the Indiana license law. Now what we are, co-brokers. That's how it works. I'm the listing agent. I have a client. You're the selling agent. You have a client. Your seller or your buyer wants to see my seller's house. If we agree on it, then we co-broker the deal. So that's a lot of times when you hear it called the co-brokerage. It's between the listing agent and the selling agent. Used to be as a listing agent, I knew Kim dealt with buyers. I would hire her to go find a buyer. And then when she found a buyer, I would pay her that sub-agency. She was an agent of an agent. The problem with that is where would Kim's loyalty lie? To me, because I'm the one paying you. All right? So they, that's why we've outlawed that. So now there's the definite distinction. You have a client that's a buyer. I have a client that's a seller. Our buyers and sellers decide they want to do a deal. We co-broker. And that's one of the things that um, you guys need to understand, that we are both trying to get this done. You know, there are a lot of people out there that want to seem to make this adversarial. Like, I'm going to stick it to the other agent. Dude, what's the advantage to sticking it to the other agent? You don't close the deal? Woo, guess what that means? Nobody gets paid. Now, the other side of that coin is don't lie to get a deal done. But, I mean, you guys should always be moving forward. Anybody read my analogy on Facebook today? I thought maybe the sports guy would. Scrum? Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. That's what it's like. We're all in this big pile, but we still got to move the pile forward. So deal with your client. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a follower. I heard rugby. Yeah, I don't know. That was the analogy I came up with. It seemed to make a lot of. Yeah. Yeah, and the other agent that I'm working with right now was a great example of that. I mean, Nancy Ali is her name. She's a good agent. She called me and she goes, how are we going to get this to work? Okay, my, I'm telling you now, my client has a problem. I'm admitting that. Let's figure out what we can do. So we, I, I brought in the roofer, got a price. We knocked the price down on the roofer. We agreed that to, to raise the price, to cover the price of the roof, and we got the deal to close, and I think we're going to close the 22nd. We originally were going to close the 29th, but they got approved already. So now they're like, well, let's move quicker. Now my client's under the pressure of we don't have anywhere to move. So I was looking for properties for him today. Um, earnest money, the depositing, we, we have talked about this a number of times. Remember, we have multiple earnest money accounts. I can earn interest. I just can't keep it. What? I can. If I wanted to, there's no law says I can only have one. Ironically, the funny thing is it says I can commingle earnest monies together, but I can't commingle my money with earnest money. I mean, I can bring, if you work for me and you had an a deal, I can put your 500 in the earnest money account, and then Gwen brings, works for me, brings a deal, I can put her client's earnest money in the same account as your client's earnest money. But I can't put that earnest money in my account. Or the other side of that, a lot of people don't realize, is I can't put my money in the earnest money account. 
That's also commingling. Except for the money it takes to run the account. Well, you're right, but I can't put business money. I mean, commingling is putting earnest money into a general account, right? And you've got an earnest money account. It's also commingling to do that. So if you get a general check to the office and you put it in the wrong bank account, that's the earnest money account, that's commingling as well. All right? only exception to personal money going into a earnest money account would be the mo account it, money it takes to run that account. Like if there were monthly fees or you need money to open an account, they won't let you open it empty, so you got to put 10 bucks in or 100 bucks or something like that. You can put that personal money into an earnest money account to do that. Um, I know a lot of companies have an earnest money account for commercial and an earnest money account for residential. So they have two. <clears throat> I know one company that does earnest money accounts on all their bank owned homes and an earnest money account on other what they call mom and pop homes. So they can have to report different. Um, I know one guy that has an earnest money account that he lit when he listed HUD homes, that's all he put was the HUD earnest money in there so that in case it got audited by HUD, he wouldn't get all his deals sucked into the audit. So he just used all the HUD listings in there. Um, closing documents and the closing statement are probably the biggest problem you guys are going to have because now there's documents upon documents and there's documents that you sign that show that you got all the documents. You know, I remember starting when I started, closing took, you know, 25 minutes. The one I was at the other day was an hour and a half. And have you guys had anyone yet where they've had like a first and a second loan? Take your picnic. Because they sign all the loan documents for the first lien, then they got to go sign a second set of loan documents for the second lien. Yeah, uh, it's a two-hour closing. And then you sign, um, I like the one where you sign, it says... We are a title company. We did not give you legal advice, so you got to sign that one. Didn't you guys just advise me to sign that? Hmm. It's like I lost my GPS the other day. How do I find it? Okay, this obviously didn't go anywhere. I'll take that one off the list. You guys did see that I'm at Crackers next Tuesday night? Yeah. Uh, 8 o'clock. Oh, it's... <laughs> That was pretty good. He's been practicing that one all day. He's got the timing down and everything. Yeah. Hey, what, what Fuck you, man. I ain't telling you now. <laughs> Next. Uh, Tuesday night, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I got an email yesterday, or, or Tuesday, it said, you know, just one more week to your show. Here's some uh, pointers and stuff like that. I'm like, what show? So I called them. I'm like, am I on? They're like, yeah, next Tuesday night we'll get you on for the 18th or 16th or whatever day that is. I'm like, holy crap. I guess I better get another routine up. So obviously I'll take that joke out of it because that, that one didn't go anywhere. Yeah, that's... No, I, I forgot it now. I can't even remember. Can't even remember what it was. Yeah, I lost my GPS. How do I find it? See, because GPS tells you where stuff are and where to go and how to. Find it. Don't use logic into this. I didn't say they were all golden nuggets. Okay. They all can't be stellar pieces of, what was the one I said the other day that I just laughed? I laughed, and if I laugh, I think it's a good one. I don't know. Closing documents. You can use that one. Yeah. Okay, I'll throw that one out next time, and then people I have done that where you have a joke, and then you talk about a joke about the joke. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forget what it was. I was talking about something, and, and the joke died, and I said, Ooh, that was the entire joke. And then the people laughed at that. But they didn't laugh at the joke. Yeah. 
So the next time I did it, I did it that way. I did it as a joke, waited for no one to laugh, and then I said, oh, that was the entire joke, and that works. Yeah. So sometimes there is, you know what, well, when you see a comedian that may be doing something offhand, you know, where he says something to the crowd, lots, I've got stuff like that all the time. If you see the same... Yeah, if you see the same show, you're going like, uh, he asked that question, or he did that same when you talk to the crowd, because that's part of, oh, man, never mind. Yeah, I'm recording. That's okay. On the closing documents, we have a list of all the documents I want to see before you get paid. So you have to bring back all of those documents, and most of them the title company ends up giving you. You know, we want copies of the HUD, which is now not a HUD anymore. We now want copies of, you know, yada, yada, yada. About the only thing you don't get copies of is the mortgage document itself. Um, you get copies of the closing statement. You get copies of the lead-based pay. You get copies of all that. Now, when they get back to the office, my people also, like I just said earlier, have forms they have to fill out to get paid. We have a closing form where they literally have all the forms listed, that they have to bring me. And they literally just check off, here's the lead-based paint form, if applicable. Here's the so-and-so form. And then if all the checks are, boxes are checked, they come to me and go, I want paid. I look at it and go, okay, we got it all. How much is your earnest money? Da -da 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 -da. And then I go into the banking system and they give me the check and I say, okay, within 48 banking hours, it will be in your account. Yep. It's a completely new system. I was just talking to Dearborn today about the books. Uh, because, see, our books are wrong. The books we're teaching now are still teaching HUD and the balancing of the HUD statement. No. Well, the state, when I called the state about the TRID, they had no idea it was coming in October 1st last year. So they still have not changed the requirements that I need to teach the HUD closing statement is one of the requirements I need to teach. So is that going to be, is that a handout that you give? Yeah, so I now use Chicago Titles handout that has a different statement. So in that chapter, if you remember, yeah, I, have yeah, I use Chicago Title. But Dearborn book today said that they are having a new 19th edition amended version come out with the new TRID in it. That's a good question, and I'm not. Because if they haven't, then you need to teach them the old way. If they have, yeah. They have yeah. Well, we had this exact problem when we went from salespersons to brokers, because the new laws. The question was, we're teaching the new laws. Did the company that makes the test actually put a new test on on July the first, which is the data when it happened? Which the problem with that is, and I, you know, I don't want to get into it, legally I couldn't teach the new laws because they weren't laws until July the 1st. So what happened was you had a couple of people who I know of that took the class that ended like July the 26th. If they waited until after the July the 1st, they got taught the old laws and tested on the new laws. Because the state said we couldn't t talk about the new laws until they became laws. And you know this as well as I do. There are proposed laws, and we got to vote on them on July the 1st. Well, maybe something will happen and they won't pass. Not like it won't ha ever has, but it might. So we couldn't teach the new laws until they went, I, and it passed. Well, the problem was all the people in the last couple weeks got the old stuff, and now it's new laws. Same thing's going on right now. you got the TRID rather than the HUD, but the books still have the HUD, and I don't know what the test is test testing on. I honestly can tell you that I don't think I know, understand the new trade yet. Like you said, there are so many people pointing fingers at other people that says, well, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. I'm not really sure who should be doing what. You know, I don't know if 
the lenders truly are the ones causing the problem because now they've got, and if they change a number, isn't it, they've got to wait three days before they can do it. I mean, here's a little chart, and I hate to do this for the people at home, but here's a little chart with a calendar date on it that you can spin. So you can actually line up the arrows on the date. It'll tell you how soon, what's the soonest you can close. Because you can't, there's no more, oh, we need to change that number and I'll see you at 4 o'clock. No, you change the number, now it's going to be three more days before we can close because it's got to go through a whole rigmarole. Yeah. Yeah. If you email the paperwork, it's this. If you hand deliver it, it's that. So your broker's role at closing, we always know that you're there to because of to schmooze and help them out, and answer questions, um, and that's your last chance to go. Hey, I'm a good guy. If you need to have anybody else, all that. After the closing, one of the things that Century Twenty One was really big on, and they had this thing called the Forever Client. Um, so that they would always touch that client, you know, every month for like 15 months. Just, hey, I just wanted to thank you for helping me out. Don't forget if you've got friends and family. There's an old saying in selling, it's always easier to keep a client than to get a new one. But a lot of us tend to forget to do that once the client closes. Maybe it's because of the life cycle in real estate, seven to nine years. You know, if we were selling vacuums every, or bowling balls or something where it's every shorter, we might contact our old clients. But you guys probably should have a way to contact your old clients every once in a while. Hey, remember me? I'm still here. You know, I'm still looking for more help. I can honestly tell you I have not seen any more person on Facebook than David put his picture on a business card on there. I see him do it probably every third or fourth day. If you're looking for a buyer and he takes a picture of his business card, he's, I've seen him do it the most from anybody I've ever seen to the point where it's starting to, no. It's starting to get annoying, Dave. You'd be amazed how many referrals I get on. Yeah. Personal I'm telling you right now, you guys, this is what you need to keep. This is what you're looking for. Top of mind consciousness. Literally, that is all this is anymore. So that when someone goes, I need to buy a house. Oh, really? Who's that guy I keep saying that? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Grinnable. Yeah, Dave Gr Yeah, that. call that guy. Because I've seen him. I can't pronounce his name, but I've seen him every day for the last three days on Facebook. Or what we used to do the old way is every time you open the refrigerator, there's the little magnet on the refrigerator. I see his face every time I get in the refrigerator. So that's all you have to do is so that somebody goes. Yep. The neatest tchotchke I've seen. Tchotchke. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is the need because it, it's it's different. It, it kind of fits in your hand. It's not the stick kind of thing. Yeah. But it's got their name on it. So every time you're eating pizza, you got three. The have you not? The the guy right over here in this corner, Cutco, cutlery. They now emblazon with the like the big butcher knife, with your logo and your face and your phone number and all that. And a lot of people are giving those now as closing costs. Go talk to that guy. Yeah, it's yeah, like a butcher knife, and you give it to him in a nice presentation box. But like Dave says, every time they cut something, they're out in your face. But it's Cutco that does that. And the guy's literally right in that corner. That's what he does. He trains all the new agents on how to sell the cutlery. Shot glass.